We got you covered all day. NBA love. Two of the best in the West clash today when the Blazers ride into Big D to take on the Mavericks. Game time, 2 p.m. Eastern, right after we're done here on ESPN. Welcome back to San Diego. It's late morning here, so I say good morning, America, which is a great segue to a very special guest, Robin Roberts, who's with Andrew Kramer. All right, Stu, thank you very much. Hall of Fame members of the 72 Dolphins will be a part of today's coin toss. After all, this is the 30th anniversary of the only undefeated team in NFL history. Of course, you know about the Greasies and the Shulas and the no-name defense, but one of the most popular and beloved teammates was wide receiver Marlon Briscoe. And what made him so unique? Don Shula brought him in to take pressure off of poor Warfield. He played in Super Bowl VII, he started in Super Bowl VIII, and was the Dolphins' leading receiver in 1973. But before all that, he was the Jackie Robinson of starting quarterbacks. He was an athlete ahead of his time, like a Michael Vick, fleet of foot with a cannon for an arm. That's why he was dubbed Marlon the Magician. But the collapse of his life after football made all that success disappear. I live to do drugs. I mean, get up in the morning, do drugs. Go to bed at night, drugs. I live to do drugs. Marlon Briscoe is a wide receiver on the undefeated 1972 Miami Dolphins. But 17-0 became a moniker with a different meaning for Briscoe in his life after football. When I lost everything, you know, uh, and my life became street life, I, you know, uh, my nickname was, here comes 17-0 by all the drug dealers. And, you know, they, and it, didn't, it didn't bother me because drugs took place of everything I wanted to do in life. The year was 1968, and all Broncos rookie Marlon Briscoe wanted to do was play quarterback. Three games into that season, he became the first black starting quarterback in the history of professional football and finished as the runner-up for Rookie of the Year. Yet the next season, he was told he'd have to compete for a job as a wide receiver. Briscoe asked for his release. He received no offers to play quarterback, so he joined the Buffalo Bills and converted to receiver. After two seasons, Briscoe was traded to Miami where he won two Super Bowl rings. He left the Dolphins following the 74 season and bounced around the league before retiring in 1977. He became a bond broker in Los Angeles. I did uh, start to hang around with the wrong people and make wrong decisions. And uh, I think because of the fact that I did not have to prepare myself and did not have something to look forward to every Sunday, um, that I um, kind of let myself slide it. By 1978, Briscoe had become addicted to cocaine. There's the images of you laying out for a great catch or, or making a great pass. What was the picture of you as a drug addict? The picture was sad. Uh, I was just one of the down and out uh, characters that uh, inhabited, you know, these seedy hotels and uh, sleeping on the street. There's a lot of guys I played with that was drinking and partying and, and I could predict it. I never felt that Marlon would be a victim. Lived in the gutter, slept in the gutter, ate in the gutter, and did some bizarre things just to get drugs, and too bizarre to even mention how I would be uncomfortable mentioning him. Where would you sleep? <laughs> Places like this. Or... On a, on a couch like this? Like just this, in the turned alley. over. But, uh, yeah, just, you know, uh, uh, something like this. I mean, there were a lot of uh, old couches, and, uh, you know, people used to be up and down this, this alley a lot, and I was included. He was in jail, or he was out on the street, as low as a person can go. I think as low as you can go when you call people on the phone that you, and ask them for $2. Having squandered nearly a million dollars, Briscoe was reduced to asking his ex-teammates for money. I loaned it to him, and then he wouldn't think a second about loaning it to him. He didn't even think twice about it. And then I talked to some other teammates, and they told me mom on that bar money from them too and that's when the uh, bell clicked in my head said, oh something must be wrong my position was and this may appear to be cold and it may be appear to be callous 
uh, was not to support Marlon Briscoe or help him in that manner, simply because I understood the concept of enabling. And as much as he is my friend, as much as I wanted to help him and reach out and help him, I couldn't help him by, you know, putting fire into his hands. And that's that's a very difficult decision. How did it feel for you to have to ask your former teammates for money? There's a lot of humility. I mean, uh, you know, I hated to ask, you know, guys that I did battle with, uh, guys that we had the ultimate success with, uh, for money to feed a drug habit. Briscoe's addiction nearly got him killed when he was kidnapped for three days by a street gang over a drug debt. Briscoe survived by jumping out of a moving car on an L.A. freeway. Could have been rock bottom to get kidnapped and then want cocaine from the same people who kidnapped him. So that could have been rock bottom. I mean, that should have been rock bottom. You had a gun to your head, you kidnapped, you know you're going to die if you don't come up with the money. Yet you still craving, you know, you're still craving drugs. I was still a drug addict. In 1990, 13 years into his addiction, Briscoe was sentenced to 90 days in a San Diego jail for drug possession. It was a time of reflection, uh, being, you know, placed in a jail with lifers, and, you know, people that are going perhaps to death row, and I promised myself that that's what, that was it. And when I did get out, that that was, uh, I'm going to turn my life around and be the person that uh, I knew I would be. What was the challenge that you had coming out? I had to walk in that jail with $500 in my pocket, past the same drug dealers who used to circle the block. You know, they used to circle the block in San Diego and sell cocaine. And I had to walk by them. You know, I was still a drug addict now. Just because I was in jail and I had to resolve to say I'm, I'm going to you know, do better, I still had some addiction in me, and I still wanted to. And I kept walking, and I kept walking, and I kept walking, and I never looked back. You want to point toward the target. You don't bring the ball out here. You bring the ball past your ear, backwards, past your ear, forward. Today, Briscoe is the assistant project manager for the Watts Willowbrook Boys and Girls Club in Los Angeles, just a few miles away from where he once lived on the streets. He says he has been drug free for almost 13 years. You have to kill me get me through drugs because if I did drugs again, I'm a dead man walking, uh, period. I always pity the, the call that I may get, but right now, it looked like Marlon is winning. Briscoe says it's taken about eight years to get his life back in order, but there remains one elusive goal, to recover the two Super Bowl rings he lost during his years as a drug addict. The rings, which were put up as collateral, were sold by a bank when Briscoe defaulted on a loan. That would be the icing on the cake. If I could get my rings back, um, I, I, I just, it's, it's uh, just, yeah, sometimes I just want to cry. Why does the discussion of your rings make you so emotional? When I go back to all of the uh, reunion, I'm the only one that doesn't have this ring. And uh, I've been trying to get them back. Uh, and hopefully if I can find out who has them and make an offer, uh, I'd, uh, I'd love to, to have those rings back. But uh, I'm hoping. Man, you always hear players talk about the importance of the ring so you understand why he wants them back so badly. And one thing I'm really curious about, Andre, is that he was only with the Dolphins for three years, yet his former teammates really came to his aid. Well, players talk about the bond that they built on that undefeated team, and, and Briscoe is really an embodiment of that. In fact, I was at the Dolphins' 30th reunion back in December, and at the golf tournaments, at the banquets, players were hugging Marlon. They were just so happy to see him and proud of what he'd overcome. In fact, Larry Little told me a story that the last time he'd seen Marlon was at a reunion 10 years prior to that, when Briscoe was in his drug days. Larry Little said he didn't even recognize Briscoe, even though he'd been the best man at his wedding. And sort of a coincidence for today, when Briscoe turned his life around, he was doing some coaching. He was at West LA College, and one of his players, Keyshawn Johnson. Who, of course, we'll see in Super Bowl 37. I really love the fact you were telling me that a lot of the contemporary black quarterbacks that are here, they know who Briscoe is. Yeah, a guy like Aaron Brooks yeah. has come up to Briscoe, has acknowledged what he's meant to the game, and it means so much to Marlon that they know 
he paved the way for their success. Love to hear that. Great piece, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks so much. Robin. All right, let's go back now to Stu. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Robin. 63,000 fans will pile into Qualcomm Stadium for the third time in Super Bowl history. Game time's a few hours away. We'll be back. Again, on Countdown. When Rich Gannon looks over the middle, chances are he's going to see Derek Brooks, the Defensive Player of the Year. Meet the Bucks tackling machine and find out what makes him the best in the business. And we're here aboard the Naval Aircraft Carrier USS John C. Stennis. I'm with some of my closest friends. Coming up, we're going to show you how that Raiders explosive passing attack is going to challenge the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. Hey, 